Uh, hey, hey, Jim, this is Dan. I can't get my camera to work tonight for some reason. So, oh, okay. Yeah. And and the reason is is we do Zoom for some stuff at work. Peter, and see. I have my camera off, but my camera will be off, Joe, during this. Okay. All right. Thank you, Joe. There's Peter. Hi, Peter. Hi, Got Peter. No problem, I guess. What a pretty day. I know it was gorgeous out today. I'm assuming that Jim Fisher is one of the attendees, but I can't tell which one it is. Jim, could you raise your hand as an attendee? There we go. Thank you. Mr. Peter. All right. Yes. Okay. The June 16th, 2020 meeting of the Planning Board for the Town of Cape Elizabeth is now in session. As a result of the COVID-19 virus, the Planning Board will conduct the meeting via remote access as provided by Maine law. The Planning Board will use Zoom meeting to conduct the meeting and to allow the public to remotely attend and participate. Zoom will allow planning board members, applicants, and members of the public to hear all discussion and hear votes, which will be taken by roll call as required by law. So first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from our last meeting on May 19th. Does anyone have any comments or questions about the minutes? Okay, seeing none, do I have a motion? I move, I move we approve the meeting minutes. Second. Can I get it? Okay. Um, I, I think Maureen. I've just joined the meeting. Pardon me, Peter? I think I've just joined the meeting. It wasn't on before. Oh, okay. Um, Maureen, can you take a uh, roll call vote, please? I'm happy to, but who was the second on the minutes? Me. Carol Ann. Okay, uh, Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Mr. Shalott. Yes. Thank you. Okay, it's unanimous. The next item on the agenda is the 287 Ocean House Road Village Retail Site Plan. Michael Friedland, doing business as Yam Yams LLC, is requesting site plan review to operate a 1,324 square foot village retail lumber store with 256 square feet of office and 400 square feet of institutional use for do-it-yourself class in the existing 1,980 square foot building located at 287 Ocean House Road. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19.9 site plan regulations and section 19.64 town center zoning district regulations. So we'd like to begin by having the applicant summarize the changes made to the application since our last meeting. Okay, can everybody, this is Jim. Can everybody hear me okay? Can you see me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. I uh, know I can't see you. I can hear you. And Maureen, will you be showing this uh, visual material? I'm happy. Jim, we can see you now. Okay, yes, thank you. There you are. So um, the question is, Jim, do you want to be me to make you host and you can put up your own plans? 
Uh, no, sure? I think we're only going to because uh, uh, Elisa's got uh, several of her plans as well, and she'd like to be able to do it. So I think if you've got the uh, ability to be able to just pop them up there as we need them, that's great. And I only need the one site plan. All right. So you know, I'll, I'll start with the site plan if that's all right then. Sure. Thank you. Okay, so everyone, um, again, I'm Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil. I am joined by Michael Friedland and uh, Alyssa Fanadasic here um, to discuss this project. <clears throat> this is, as Maureen was uh, pointing out, uh, this has been before you for quite a long time, so we'd like to be able to wrap this up here relatively soon. Um, ideally, we'd love to be able to receive conditional approval this evening, uh, but we do have a couple of things to go over. Um, there are very minor things, re relatively speaking, regarding the engineering and the site plan, and uh, then I think we'll get to the, the building uh, pursuant to some of the comments that we had at the site walk uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So I'm going to go down uh, Marines covered the town plan or comments. Uh, and again, in the interest of brevity, just kind of go through this. And then obviously, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them and I will address them appropriately. So under Marines comments, uh, utilization of the site, we still do not have the VRAP program back from the, or the VRAP permit back from the DEP. Uh, we did check with them this past Friday. They are still working on it. They do acknowledge that they need to get it to us as soon as possible. They're busy. There's not too many people there, et cetera. It's going to be a little while. Um, that could mean a week or it could mean a month. Obviously, the town will get that. We'll send that. I think a copy of it will directly be sent to Marine anyway. Um, but as soon as we get a copy, we'll send it to you or to Marine, and the board can certainly see that if they wish. Um, as far as traffic access and parking is concerned, um, Site distances, we saw that at the, uh, the site walk. Um, I would suggest respectfully that really nothing needs to be done. Uh, our traffic engineer was indicating that at some point in the future, uh, if and when these uh, uh, bushes that are in that little circular area up near the intersection start getting out of hand, then they should certainly be trimmed back. We're happy to do that when it gets to that point. We're gonna be trimming landscaping on our own property anyway. Um, otherwise, uh, most of those bushes are indeed in the uh, uh, the DOT air right of way, so they would be Bob. Uh, they would be the uh, Department of Public Works would ostensibly take care of those, but we're happy to trim them at this point. From what we all saw, the site distances are not an issue for us, um, so I would just propose to be able to leave them as they are. They seem to be doing pretty well on their own. Uh, we will obviously then augment. This gets ahead of ourselves a little bit, but as far as the landscaping is concerned, since we're over in that area. You can see on the plan that we have augmented the landscape uh, with uh, other bushes and the trees that were approved by the uh, arborist. And uh, we've got several that are in the landscaped area at the back end of the parking area. And then again, we filled in that strip, that concave strip area that's uh, along Ocean House Road. The pedestrian circulation talks about the, uh, the pathway. <clears throat> um, we spoke with, uh, with Michael about that. He would like to, uh, with all um, due respect to any other suggestions, would like to keep it the way it is. Uh, essentially where it looks on the screen. <clears throat> that provides two different areas or two different abilities. Somebody to walk off of the sidewalk, the public sidewalk on Old Ocean House and also captures some of the traffic that's uh, uh, immediately adjacent as you can see to the, uh, to the or opposite the building so that people can walk up on the stone dust pathway and then follow it along to where the crosswalk is. It will be painted on by us on the parking lot. That leads then right into that uh, section of building with the northerly, with the southerly wing uh, which is where the entrance is, or near the, where the entrance is. Uh, we would like to uh, keep it as a stone dust pathway. It's not a problem if we want to go to, to bituminous concrete, but uh, stone dust kind of keeps in, in character with the, the landscaped area over which it runs. Uh, so we think that that will be, uh, from an aesthetic standpoint as well as practical, that would be quite nice. Uh, the cost difference is not that great, so it's really not an issue in that regard. It's more of a, we just feel that this keeps in character with the site a little bit better. Um, then there are uh, several other things that uh, didn't really re need responses, stormwater management, erosion control, utilities, et cetera. Uh, we talked about the landscaping and buffering. As far as the uh, lighting is concerned, the on-site lighting, we discussed that at the site plan as well. We are keeping the one pole that is over by the uh, lumbery storage area. The other uh, bases have to be kept intact according to the DEP regarding the VRAP. Uh, the poles themselves will come out, but uh, the electrical bases need to stay there because we cannot excavate them up. Uh, as far as off-site lighting is concerned, I'd like to come back to that here um, at the, uh, after the end of this and we discuss the, uh, the poles, the off-site poles. Uh, jumping down to the uh, dust collector, uh, Michael has indicated that um, he's got a life safety plan that he is working on, as Michael Friedland is working with Ben, uh, the codes officer on, 
And uh, that particular life safety plan did not address the uh, people in the classes uh, that would be able to get up into that raised platform, that mezzanine as it were. So toward that end, that life safety program is still an ongoing portion of it. So we're, Michael, in the, uh, uh, basically the intent of being able to open up as soon as possible to start getting some business going at the lumbery is going to forego the classes at this time. And we will come back to the board at such point in time when the life safety program is completed. And then we're ready to move ahead with those classes. So you'll see us again at some point here over the next several months. His biggest focus of attention right now is just trying to get open for business to be able to uh, uh, meet his livelihood. So uh, toward that end, we're only looking at the retail establishment, the very small office that anybody typically has inside of a retail establishment where he will end up uh, doing his bookkeeping work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's it. There's, as, as it was last time, there's no food trucks, there's no band or, or, or music venues. Um, and in this particular case, then we're default, we're um, delaying the, uh, uh, the actual classroom. So again, we're only looking at retail and the office within the building. Uh, as far as the dust collector and the classes are concerned, because there won't be any classes, uh, most of that uh, noise from those specific um, instruments will not be in, in vogue. Um, they will typically be used only when they are actually cutting lumber to fit. Somebody comes in and buys a two by 10 and they want a two by eight and a half, he'll just chop off that last foot and a half and that's essentially all there is to it. Uh, you do have the uh, reviewed um, sound engineer's um, information that's in your packet. And he does say that the dust collector, when added to a decibel level of a higher machine, is imperceptible. So the dust collector itself, because it's not venting to the outside and nothing is going to be on the outside, um, is basically imperceptible in terms of the decibel levels. So we should be all set with that, especially now given that we're not dealing with any classes where these machines are gonna be going uh, quite frequently in the evening, that won't be the case. Um, as far as the uh, storage of materials are concerned, this is number 12. Uh, we would like to be able to have, as we mentioned at the site walk, some outdoor storage, somewhat similar to drill-ins for instance, uh, that, that are underneath the canopy in the front and uh, along the northerly side of the building, uh, just for those seasonal items that are meant to attract people, somewhat like a hardware store, you know, rakes in the springtime, shovels in the wintertime, some uh, packets of, of ice pellets, that, that kind of thing. Uh, we do understand that the predominance of all those things uh, need to be able to come in on a daily basis, those which are right out front. There may be a few things, the heavier items such as the sacks, obviously the lumbery items, et cetera, are gonna be staying there. Uh, other than that, then we're all set and uh, we just like to be able to have the board weigh in on uh, uh, that temporary daily display of information out front. Notwithstanding that, uh, the, Steve Hart, or the uh, reviewing engineer's comments were only talking basically about working with the town as far as getting the easement is concerned uh, for the area of the new sidewalk that's on Scott Dyer. We're absolutely happy with that. We stated that before. Uh, Steve just mentioned it again. We're happy to work with the town's attorney regarding uh, putting something together for that for an easement. And with that, um, I'd be happy to answer or address any comments or questions regarding site plan, or we can go right into the building. Uh does anyone have any quick questions for Jim before we move on? Okay, I have one. Can you just, I didn't catch where you're saying that stuff is going to go on the outside of the building, like in drill, like, like they have a drill in? It's on the front sidewalk immediately underneath the eave. That eave is about a, a four, four and a half foot eave and uh, that sticks out over the front sidewalk. And uh, on either side of the door, um, nicely done. Uh, there would be, you know, just small little racks that would be very portable for those minor seasonal items that would be out to be able to attract people's attention to uh, the store itself. And that's it. And then in the evenings, they, that uh, the majority of that information or that uh, equipment would be brought in. So, okay. Jim or Joe, can I ask a question? Yes, please. So this is the first we've heard of things being on display outside the building and that the seasonal items like shovels and rock salt are going to be sold here. I thought it was just a lumbery for good wood. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about this? Because this is something new and this goes along with the fact that now all of a sudden at the 11th hour we're finding out that no classes are going to be part of this and that had been one of the things that had been discussed this whole time and given the fact that we are the planning board um, our hopes are that we're going to know all the things that are planned for this building um, so can you tell us everything that uh, any other surprises that we're going to get hit with this evening? 
Uh, no, not this evening. Um, as far as the information that's out front or the uh, equipment that would be out front, again, there's just a few seasonal items. Uh, it is primarily, first and foremost, a lumbery store. It's going to be dealing with wood products and lumbers. Uh, you know, they're not going to be selling light bulbs and bird seed, what have you, but there are a few things that would go along with people who might be building, you know, their own shed or uh, building a deck or what have you. And there may be, again, these seasonal items like a shovel or, or a rake um, or those uh, Jim, types of things. Do you, mind if I that, chi do you mind if I chime in in that regard in, in terms of what we're going to be selling? Certainly. Yeah, it's a building supply store, so it is uh, primarily wood and working with local mills in Maine, but it's also wood-related products, so all your fasteners that have to deal with wood. It could be a uh, house wrap. Um, it could be hand tools. It's basically, if you're working with wood, what do you need? And then we'll also probably sell some garden supplies as well, and um, we'd like to be a service to the community, so we would like to offer seasonal items that the community could use, such as shells, rakes, uh, rock salt, things of that nature. Do you see this turning into a hardware store over time? No way, no, we're not gonna do keys, plumbing, electric. Uh, we're not selling uh, custom fasteners. We don't have cleaning supplies. We don't have doorknobs. It's, it's basically wood and wood related items. So if you're building a deck, we'll have joist hangers, we'll have post bases, we'll have the screws. So if you're a carpenter and you're working with wood, we're your place. Hey, hey Jim, um, the si lighting on a sidewalk. So you, you're not proposing any of the, the light fixtures that we had talked about in the past. Uh, you mean the ones along the road or the ones internal to the site? Along the road. Yes. Yeah, we, I want to get to that. I just wanted to be able to get to that here after the, uh, um, the discussion on the uh, building, only because okay. it happened to be off-site right. information. I'll wait. I'll wait. Okay, are there any other questions for Jim? Yeah, so Jim, maybe this isn't you, but it might be somebody else that might be able to answer it. On the Scott Dyer side of the building, there's new to the plan this uh, for this submission was this window um, not related to the windows that are already there but a new window um, am I reading that correct I'm aware of the window but I can't really answer your questions about the building I think Elisa would should be able to chime in uh, when we start talking about the structure okay so I'll wait to talk about the structure then all right any other questions for Jim on what he just proposed or what he's just shown All right, uh, then let's go on to Elisa. Hi, everyone. Um, could we pull Hi. up the architecture drawings? Alyssa, do you want to do your own thing? Um, it's okay. We can just pull up the um, AE, I think it's A100. Okay. Was, were they submitted with this application? Um, I believe so. If not, I can pull it up on my computer too. If they're in the plans, I can pull them up. Is that the sheet that came with the life safety plan in the email? The life, saf the life safety plan was, yeah, that's separate from what was submitted. Okay, this is what I think she wants. That is correct. Okay. So if we go to this sheet um, and we can start with the Ocean House Road. 
I can kind of cover what has changed since the last meeting. So if we focus on this elevation, since the last meeting, we removed um, the existing door that was confusing the circulation for where the main entry was, as well as added a dormer over the new proposed entry with uh, three sliding doors. We also added a large window to either side to kind of create um, the rhythm of the original structure, as well as create a distinctive entry um, for the building. Uh, this drawing also shows the proposed locations of the wall packs that's spaced so that you do have um, a nice pattern and rhythm of the front facade. And uh, if we're keep uh, moving on changes from the last meeting, on the Scott Dyer Road, we added a large window. Could we? Using the proportion of the existing window to create um, a visual relationship between the existing and the new. This is not the most updated because I think there are some existing conditions that prevent this window from being exactly centered. So this window is actually um, slightly off centered to the left of this, which I think was in and was sent over. If not, I can share it on my screen. I believe it was sent, Jim. It was sent. Do you remember what it would have been called? I don't. It was in the uh, email. It was in the email, yes. Here we go. Um, no, that's not it. Why don't I just let you post, Alyssa, if you're okay with that? Yeah, no problem. Joe, can I just ask a quick question on that? Yes. Um, Alyssa, can you just explain why it's a little bit off center? Yeah, as we saw when we were at the site visit, the CMU kind of goes further than where this window is showing. So it kind of ends, and there's a photo of the existing condition, I think, in the package itself. So, so you're using the existing opening. We're using the existing opening. So that was a field condition that when we went back and we would like to center it, but we can't center it because of the CMU wall that's shown in the existing photos. So there is existing. Yep, what we saw block wall. was. Okay, so Alyssa, before you came on the project, it was represented to us numerous times that there was, that was a block wall, that it would have been very difficult to put an entrance over there, or put a, wind, a window over there. Um, and it wasn't until just now on this last submission that it's now being shown to us that there actually was an opening and from the pictures that were provided to us, it looks like there were two openings. Um, but so I just wanna know if that's what is, now it's sort of being changed that there was an opening and you guys are dealing with that opening by putting in a window. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Yeah, the conditions are not exactly symmetrical and I think that's a case of this building being reused multiple times um, as mostly a, a gas station. So they've infilled and cut into it. So finding the exact existing conditions and I've only since joining the project been able to, to visit once. So it, it's kind of an unforeseen condition. So I apologize, but I think this new location reflects the most accurate condition of where we can get an opening to kind of create a more inviting appearance, which was um, requested from the last meeting. So we added the window as well as um, putting a wall pack in the top of that triangle. So I think those are the changes from the last planning board meeting was addressing the distinctive entrance as well as kind of making this a, a more inviting to the Scott Dyer Road. Because I think uh, this will be the, the main entrance and, and this will just be more pleasant. Joe, question. Uh, Go ahead, so, Peter. What, what is a wall pack, please? A wall pack is a kind of a small square box that throws light uh, for the parking lot. Oh, okay. It's an exterior light. A little exter exterior light, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. You're welcome. And Jim, you, I assume you included those wall packs on the photoelectric study? Yes. Okay. The only thing, yeah, and the, the photoelectric study is uh, refocusing those and the 
single light in the back corner by the lumbry storage shed and not any longer the three poles that we're removing. Okay. There will be two here. So do you have anything else, Alyssa, or should we start asking questions? Um, nope, I think that addresses all the comments from the last meeting about the confusing circulation, the distinctive entrance, and the Scott Dyer elevation. So if there's um, any other questions, I'm happy to answer. All right, does anyone have any questions for Alyssa? Yeah, uh, Joe, this is Dan. Um, yeah. Alyssa, right, can you comment on the skylights? Are those new and the framing that supports those skylights and has a structural engineer look at that framing? The skylights were in the last planning board submission, so they're not new, but they are new to the project. And I believe, and Mike can correct me, but a structural engineer is reviewing them. So, I mean, uh, we'll, what does that mean, review? What does that mean? Well, I, it's- Can I interrupt the, here? Hold on. We don't, that's a, really an issue between uh, ben McDougal and the applicant when the building's getting built. Okay. It's, it's, that's construction permit. That's fair, and Joe. That's beyond really our consideration. All right. I got it. Thanks. Um, any other questions? All right. I have one. Yes. Um, so I understand keeping the existing roof at five on 12 because that is an existing condition, but with the new roof, you've used you've used the same slope, and the um, the ordinance is pretty clear the, about the minimum slope required. So that's one uh, thing I want to point out. Then second, um, the window to the right of the triple doors does that reflect? the uh, platform in the inside the building? Um, it has a note here that it would be opaque. So it would look like a window, but you probably it would probably be blacked out. So you wouldn't be able to see in similar to a condition that you have now kind of a fake window. Um, because we, we need to have the window to wall opening, but in the plan that is where the platform goes up. About where does the platform start? About right here, I believe. Okay. And I just want to make a comment. Um, it's the image shows that it's a triple door, but I've been getting quotes from door companies and chances are it's going to be um, a double door sliding out with fixed uh, panels on the sides. Can I ask one question with regards Wait, to that? You mean, is it going to, it's not going to look like this? No, so it'll be two doors in the middle that open out to the sides. Swing doors. Swing doors with one well, door fixed to the side. Is it what you're saying? Well, they're sliders, so the the two middle ones will slide outwards. So it'll be four panels, not yes. three. Right. Joe, can I ask one question? Yes, please. So the the blacked out window is that going towards the fifty percent of that wall being open or partially windows? I, I believe so, because if it's a window, it just Right, but it's a window that's blacked out. Like, what do you mean? Is it just, you're not gonna be able to see in or see out or? It could be frosted. Um, I haven't exactly discussed it with Mike right. yet. It'll, it's considered like obscure, like you have in a bathroom. If you have a window in a bathroom, it's obscured so people can't see in. So there'll be light coming in, but it, it wouldn't be completely transparent. Okay, but it's not gonna, none of the other windows are gonna be obscured. They're gonna be open. Yep, correct. Just in that location because of that platform. Uh, 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 Peter. Yeah, the, the, uh, I'm a little puzzled on your door. <clears throat> it's going for, uh, to four panels from three within mm -hmm. the same dimensional space in the front of the building or will, will this uh, dimensional space actually be expanded? 
No, it's a 10 foot opening. So the middle opening will be about uh, four feet and then the two panels in the middle will slide to the sides. So it'll okay. be within the same 10 yeah. feet. Yeah. Right, same opening. Okay. Yeah. Just four panels rather than three visually. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Did did we finish the discussion on the roof slope, Joe? I don't. I no, I brought it up, but it, there's no response to it. Um, we. I guess we just figured that it would match the existing condition to keep the existing slope, since that's visually more cohesive. But if the town is pretty clear, then. Is there a provision for existing conditions on that? Well, or? the provision is for existing conditions, but a new, I don't think, I mean, you, you could have a new slopes, a new roof steeper than the existing for, for this cross gable. And I think it would look better. Yeah, I think um, we, well, I, I tried it steeper, but the steeper it is, those windows get into a weird location. So the windows kind of get outside of that gable. Yeah. Was the first impression. Um, wow. If you think that that's a requirement, we can re revisit it. But I think maintaining kind of that large distinctive opening makes sense with- And the problem of, is your, your uh, skylights are driving the- The skylight and trying to get as much of an opening all contained within that dormer to kind of create that distinctive entrance was the idea, but. Are the skylights right. supposed to add, add the fenestration to the front? Is that why we even have skylights? Uh, no, the fenestration in this, uh, the roof doesn't add to the, the wall. So I think the provision is for the window to wall 50%. Unfortunately, but um, now did you do a calculation and show that what you have here is fifty percent? Yes, so I have it in a little square right there. Okay, I'm gonna put on my glasses. So the existing is five sixty, and with all of these windows and kind of the portion of the door taken out, it's two eighty. So it's just about exact. And that's maximizing all the um, openings currently available. Okay. It does not include the skylights, or it does? It does not include the skylights. Okay. Um, I'd kind of like to get a sense from the members, from the board members, uh, where they stand on the obscured glass. I think that's. Uh, that can be counted as contributing to the glazing on the elevation. Anyone have thoughts? I personally don't think it does. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I uh, Joe, Joe, this is Dan. I don't think yeah. it does either. Peter? Yeah, I think it does. I, I, I don't see a reason to distinguish it away because you're not gonna be looking through it. It's a, it's a facade proportionality that you're trying to achieve. And if it looks like a window, when you're standing 50 feet back and looking at the facade, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with it. I, I'm, I'm with Peter. If it was a bathroom and it had a frosted window, you wouldn't be able to see into it. So that's why I like, I think it's okay. I'm with Peter. I'm here. I, I don't have a problem. So I've done the same thing to meet a code requirement. So I would be hypocritical if I didn't, if I said I did not uh, go for it. Well, one of, one of the reasons that I don't think it does is because it's gonna completely contrast the window that's on the other side of the door. So you have a window on the left side of the door when you're facing it, that's gonna be clear that you can look into the store and then you're gonna have a door on, or you're gonna have a window on the right that's gonna be obscured and opaque and maybe blacked out, we don't know, um, but it's, it's so that contrast is to me not going to look very good and it's going to take away from 
this supposedly being the front facade of um, the building itself. So that's why I'm not considering it to be part of the 50%. Um, the existing building has three windows on it and they're all fake windows. They're all painted black behind it. And um, yeah, I, but I the building was there before the new requirements went in for the town center. Oh no, I know exactly what you're saying, but I'm just saying it's it's sort of it, it's not out of character to have a window that is is not necessarily functional, but is also there for appearance purposes, and that's essentially what that window is there for. All right, Andrew, you have a uh, opinion? Yeah, I, I I think I think it's fine, and and I could see how you could end up with a situation where you did have a bathroom that ended up in the front and you needed something like that. So it's, it seems, I mean, I think it'll look fine. And I think you have instances where people have windows and then there's all kinds of crap in it anyway in front of it. And it's, for all intents and purposes, you have something that's obscured anyway. So I think from the street, it'll, you won't really notice the difference, but that's just my opinion. All right, well, I think we should probably then move on. It seems like the majority of us aren't too. Maureen's waiting for you. I'm sorry, Maureen. I, I just wanted to, you, I'm not, not you have going to shout to out. Cause... Yeah, I'm not gonna say anything about the window discussion. So, um, but there was a question about the calculations and I just wanted to explain to the board that the reason I had recommended the calculations be provided is that I tried to do the calculations based on the floor plans that were provided. And I came up with um, 291 square feet as one, hundred, as one half. I think the front facade is a little bigger, but I shouldn't be the one calculating that. And you know, if the applicant has the architect on board now, it would be nice to check those numbers. But if the board is comfortable with what's presented, then I withdraw my comment. Can I just ask a question on that? Yes. Maureen, are you saying that it's less than 50% or more than 50%? I'm saying that the starting number is too low. That, that I came up with almost 590 square feet. And this front facade wall is calculated at 560. Did you include the gable? No, it was before the gable was in. Not include the gable. This was an existing front facade wall. I, I wouldn't know how to calculate that gable space. <laughs> um, So does anybody want to make a comment before I do? All right. Do you have a response to uh, Maureen's? Well, I, my response is that this visually to me looks like 50% glass. And, you know, it's not it's not really a building where the whole, where you could have like 95% of the uh, front open. You know, it's a box building and you got to leave some stuff for the thing to read as a box. And I mean, I would like to see, a, I would like to see like the uh, elevation with dimensions, right? What What is equaling 500 square feet? It would be, you know, whatever the width is by the height. And, uh, but I feel like visually this is pretty close. And I mean, I don't, I don't know how you could get 45 more square feet of glass on that, where it would go. I mean, I actually think those four foot wide windows are too wide. I'd rather see them like more the width of the uh, door of the triple door, but that's neither here nor there. I, I'd like to just say that this with the gable 
is a vast improvement over anything we've seen throughout the history I agree. of the submission. So I think, uh, I think it looks very nice. Mm, thank you. Big improvement. I mean, I would like to see this roof slope go up to seven on 12. I don't know how you guys feel about that. Well, with uh, Alyssa's concern about losing the, the cemetery with the windows, I don't know which is more important, the slope or the cemetery. I, I kind of go with the cemetery myself. You're not losing the symmetry of the windows. Just you're losing the windows. You're losing no, the you, your point doesn't have to, well, I was thinking of coming up from the, from the ends. From here? Yeah, so you might actually get to the ridge. Yeah, I think the skylights might be prohibiting it, but. Mm. Yeah, right. that's more what I was thinking. Yeah, I mean, bring your gable ends in. You could even go over the ridge. There's no law that says you can't. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I kind of like the 512 uh, proportion. It just seems more okay. in keeping with the, with the width of the building. Are we being inconsistent if we, you know, the town standard is seven over 12 and it's five over 12 or, you know, I know we really haven't resolved that. I don't think, you know, and yeah. if we're, are we being inconsistent if we don't ask for that? Not that I agree that we should do that, but are we being inconsistent? If they were building, a, if they were taking the roof off this building, I would say, yeah, they got to do it according to what's there. But they're not taking the original roof off the building. So yeah. it's, it is what it is. Yeah, I, I, I understand. But I, I just, just the consistent, you know, consistency. So nobody can come back and say, well, you made them do this, but you didn't make them do that. Well, it's, it's it, the, the new proportion would be an anomaly to the existing roof line. I, I don't see why we should feel the need to, to change it, frankly. Okay. I'm fine with the way it is. Don't mis, misinterpret. I, I understand what you're saying, yeah. Jim. Yeah. Just, uh, an existing structure, there's got to be some give somewhere because it just does not make sense in some instances. All right, I'm sensing some of you are okay with it as is. Is there anybody who wishes to uh, provide an alternate opinion? Because I'd like can to move on from this. Can I just ask one question? With yes. The skylights, do they have to be in that area or do they have to be in that location? Because there's no skylights in there right now. So, and they're gonna make very uh, big, imp or big improvements to this roof by taking off what that little thing that's on there now and then reshingling the entire roof i'd imagine they're going to be cutting holes for these skylights is there any big issue with having them where they are located on the plans just moving them over to get to that seven over 12 um, angle that joe's talking about um, that's we we prefer the way it looks right now we we've you know, we've spent a lot of time looking at this building, looking inside and outside, and we, we really like the way the skylights are spaced and how they would affect the interior. And it, it's a preference as, you know, as me being the builder and the, and the owner, I, I prefer the way they're set right now. I'm fine with it. I, but the reason I'm asking, I mean, okay, you have a personal preference, that's great. But what we're hearing is that it's not up to what the standards are. And so that's what guides the planning board. And the reason that we're being told is that you want to keep it the way it is is because of the location of the skylights. My question is, besides what they might look like, is there any other rationale that the skylights are in the placement that they are on the plans and anything that's prohibitive about moving them? Because I'm looking at them right now, they're not exactly centered on the building itself. You're going to have a front facade that's not right symmetrical in the flat center of the building itself. So to me, I could see those skylights being moved if that's necessary to get up to what the ordinance is. 
So what I'm asking is that there, is there anything prohibitive besides your personal preference that is making it so you cannot move that skylight location? Um, there's actually nothing prohibitive except for the fact that, you know, I'm the one who is designing it. And so when I designed it, this is the way I designed it for a preference of how it, it would look as, as any designer would. And I do think the 512 does work with the existing roof in terms of angles. Have and you so, looked into whether or not a seven, of, uh, 7 over 12 would work with the existing angles? I have looked at it. It seems tall and out of proportion, but that's kind of how I ended up with proposing the 512 because it is an existing condition and understanding that if this were new, we would absolutely meet the requirements, but the distinctive entry for a 512 roof, a 512 dormer just seemed to make sense. And it fit with the skylights that um, Mike prefers as well, so. Yeah, can I? Yeah. Pipe up. Um, in the, this is the, What's the section of mine? Well, on page 119 of the, I think the center district. Anyway, it talks about height and roof pitch and it actually says, uh, so this is business A district. This is business A, right? District? No, it's town this center. Town oh, center. town center. Andrew, well, you can go to page 96. 96, okay. So it's still in, in, in that it says 712 or as matches existing roof. So is it different then for Town center, or is that language not? Yeah, it's or as mismatches matches existing roof pitch. So, I mean, that seems to give it, you know, uh, that, I mean, leeway to, to, to match whatever's there. I mean, as I read that myself, okay, that's not well, to say necessarily yeah. say that it's better or worse the way it is. Um, it's just that language seems to allow it, in my opinion. All right, I'll buy that. Thank you for reading that. Um, does anybody else uh, have a comment on that, or can we agree to keep that to keep the pitch as is and move on? Uh, uh, Joe, this is Dan. I'm I'm good with the pitch. Okay. Uh, Twelve. Thanks. All right. Um. Um, Jim, would you like to go back to site? I wasn't sure if I can stop sharing. Are we all set, Joe? Are we all set with? Uh, uh, Let me just look at my notes real quick. I believe we are. Yeah. Okay. So we should go back to the um, the site. Joe, can I have one one more question? Actually, yes. Um, um, on the side, so there was a sign proposed on the side. Is is that still there somewhere? It's not shown, but from what I remember anyway, there was going to be, right? Yep, there was a sign that kind of was going to be the thing on that facade. Um, I do not believe there is one anymore, Mike. Can you confirm? Sorry, had to unmute. Um, yeah, at this moment, we do not have a sign on that side. It was going to be where the window is, but since the window is there, I feel like a sign would make it a little bit too busy. That's fine. I just remembered it being there, so I wanted to confirm one way or the other. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, all right, so let's go back to the uh, site then, if you're done, Alyssa. Yeah. Turning it off. All right, so just going through the memo. Um, so you're not gonna have any of the uh, do-it-yourself classes and the cutting room will just be used to cut lumber for uh, um, shoppers and not as part of the uh, maintenance business, right? Correct. At this point in time, that's correct. Okay, and then the only thing it might be used for in the future is to do it yourself. So it won't become a shop for operations for the maintenance. That is correct. Okay. Um, 
All right, so in terms of mitigation for the, uh, the increased traffic at the intersection, I had one thought, which was to put a sign at the Scott Dyer uh, exit that would disallow left turns during um, busy times so as not to, so there'd be, I mean, I don't, it would obviously probably be during uh, school hours when school is starting and ending. Um, seems like that's one thing that would be quite easy to do. And I don't see a time stamp on the uh, accidents shown there. Um, I don't know if something like that would make sense. Um, I, <clears throat> Joe, this is Jim. Um, we could do that. I'm, I'm not sure how effective that's going to be only given the guys that, and I know this is a cliche, but notwithstanding the legalities of uh, site plan approval, ultimately people are going to do whatever they want. Um, and putting, for instance, signage there that would have only a, a full access in, but only a right out, for instance, with a specific time frame attached to that is almost impossible to be able to police that. Um, so toward that end, it's easy enough to be able to put in. I'm just not sure how effective it would be to the average person who decides that he wants to turn left as opposed to right. Now, I would also um, ask to keep in mind that um, as far as the study is concerned, we're in the peak hours, which are the commuting hours, basically both morning and evening. We are adding, we're, um, the, the uh, traffic uh, study shows that we're gonna be adding two vehicles, two, during the entire peak hour time frame. That's it. The only time it jumps up further than that is on a Saturday morning, when obviously more people are at home, where during that peak hour period, it would go to 14. But keeping in mind as well that during Saturdays or on weekends, um, the commuting distance, the, the commuters during the commuting time um, are significantly less, if not actually non-existent which doesn't mean that there isn't traffic on the road, but it's nowhere near what the commuting traffic would be. The point being is that given that this used to be a full service gas station and then a convenience store gas station with an intense amount of traffic, just like Jonesy's or the Cumberland Farms has it now, this site as a retail site adding only two trips in the peak hour, it just isn't gonna do anything as far as adding to any um, specific problems with that intersection. Toward that end, I mean, again, we're open to suggestion, but I just don't think it really necessitates anything. We're just not adding that much car, many cars. Okay, anybody, no. uh, yeah, Andrew? Uh, it seems like that would probably be a, a really just a, a quick question to the traffic engineer if he thinks that's actually, you know, a reasonable thing to do and helpful or not. And I mean, I actually agree. I think most of the time people don't pay any attention to those and do not leave at such and such an hour. Um, and I have no idea if, uh, if ultimately that would hurt or save things at all. But um, certainly a question of the traffic engineer seems to make most sense. And maybe it's just a condition that they're consulted and if they think it's a good idea that it's put in and if they don't, then it's not. We can certainly ask that that's absolutely no problem. We can certainly ask Bill if, uh, um, for this or any other suggestions that he's got toward that end. I don't see this being a high traffic, you know, just like the study says, I don't think there's going to be any real noticeable change. And I agree that the sign would be a waste of time and a waste of money, in my opinion. Okay. Um, if I can move on, uh, does the planning board want to require that the table showing parking uh, is added to the site plan? Sure. Okay. That's fine. Uh, yes, Joe. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to skip over the lights too for the moment. Joe? Yes. If Maureen? You had, 
the reason I recommended the table be added is because there is, um, there's no clear statement of what the proposed uses on this site are. And the table would find some way to put on the site plan what the proposed uses are. Okay. But if the 400 square foot classroom isn't really gonna be approved as a classroom, you gotta change the table to reflect whatever it is being approved for. We can certainly add a, a parking table to it. Um, I can tell you, especially now that the classroom is gone, that uh, we've got over twice as many parking spaces as is actually required. But hoping, obviously, that uh, given the site conditions that the, uh, the establishment's going to be quite popular, we'd rather have more parking spaces than have somebody come in and not find a place to park. Um, so toward that end, we, and it flows very nicely, uh, given the way it is right now. Uh, the point being, again, is we're happy to add the table to it, but the table's going to be reflect a you know less than half of the uh, the proposed number of spaces on site. If that's that's okay. Board wants it. That's fine. Joe. Yes, Maureen. Just to be clear, the parking table is not there to regulate parking. It's to find some way to put on the site plan what the proposed uses for the site are right now. Fine. Easy. Okay. Um, we want to clarify that the lawn area is not going to be used for display. So I think that's the lawn area in between the parking lot and the sidewalk. Sure. So Just a simple should... note. A simple note on the plan, Joe. Yeah. Okay. I have a couple other thoughts on notes on the plan. Okay, fire away. The removal, the removal of the lights and how the, how the um, foundation of that's going to be capped. Because I know, I know you, you said you're going to keep the elect, you know, keep the hookup in case it's needed in the future, but how are you going to cap them off? And I, I've been looking at stuff and maybe it's in there and I just didn't see it, so. Uh, that's fine. We can, in conjunction with uh, showing the removal of the pipes, we, or the, uh, um, the poles, we can certainly show it's, it's just a tee box cap that yeah. it pops yeah. right yeah. onto it, but that's yeah. easy to be able to do. Just an indication of how it's going to happen. Sure. And I like trimming, trimming of the, of the overgrown shrubbery. Um, on the Scott Dyer side. Yes. And every and the references refer to looking to the west. And if I remember correctly, it's the looking east towards uh, 77. That is the that is the questionable uh, sight line. Yes, that's so, it. So looking west, I don't think there's anything to trim. But looking east towards 77, I think uh, some trimming of those overgrown evergreen thingies would be wonderful. That's yeah. fine. And we're happy to do yeah. that. And then, I know course. you've indicated that you're willing to do that. I just, I just, uh, the direction I think confused things because if you look west, you're going to go, oh, there's nothing there to do. So that's it. Okay. We can trim that. Okay. You want? Did you have anything else, Caroline? Um, just that in the in the conditions of approval, I could not find where the easement sidewalk easement was mentioned, and I know it's all everybody's on board with it, but it's not written anywhere in the uh, the motion. That no. I could find. Yes, Maureen. Um, I I. Think that the applicant and the town need to cooperate on that without it being a condition of approval. Okay. That's, there was okay. a reason for not being there. Okay. That's it. All right. Um, you 
uh, the material for the path. Uh, first of all, why is it going all the way across those parking spaces rather than going straight towards this front and center of the building? Um, it was just a direction that we wanted to be able to take to be able to allow some people who have uh, who exit their vehicles. The vast majority of them are going to obviously get out of their driver's side vehicle and walk straight to the building. Uh, but in this particular case, they could actually walk up onto the stone desk path and go along go around that. Not necessarily going to happen. We can certainly shorten it up if we need to. Um, we just heard that the board wanted to be able to have it uh, essentially hitting the uh, right of way sidewalk in uh, Ocean House where it does. Um, and then we just brought it along that area of the, uh, the back of the parking lot to be able to hit the crosswalk where it does. But we can uh, certainly shift it to another area if there's a preference toward that end. That's minor. That's just basic, you know, minor landscaping kind of thing. Um, yeah, I was thinking of it more like what they did down the block where they uh, created an opening that really pointed at the building. Um, and I believe that was a requirement of the board that was brought up because of the idea that it being town center and making it more welcoming to pedestrians. Yeah, it just seems odd that you walk from, I, I mean, if I were walking along the sidewalk and to go to the store, I would take a left and go right towards the center of the building rather than go all the way along the stone dust path to the left. I mean, we can, ch that, that's not an issue. I mean, we can shorten that up very easily. We can bring it in essentially where the access to the uh, right of way is right now. And then just uh, instead of curving it to the left as it goes toward the, the back of the parking stalls, we can curve it a little bit to the right and then come straight across the, uh, the parking area right Yeah, there. that seems more in keeping with the spirit of the, uh, that diagram in the town center for connection that shows connection between the sidewalk and the building. Um, also, I don't know, I don't have a great feeling about stone dust right there. It seems to me it should be like pavers of some sort. Um, Something a little more permanent. I agree with you on that, Joe. I mean, it's a matter of preference. I think the the applicant was just talking about a stone dust pathway because he thinks it keeps in character with that that whole bigger landscaped area that we've got there. I mean, ultimately, it really doesn't matter. But I think a, a, given the extent of landscaping and all the plantings we're going to have there, I think a stone dust path would probably fit in quite nicely there. And as far as maintenance is concerned, the maintenance is exactly the same as a bitconk uh, a sidewalk would be. I'm not a big fan of stone dust either. Would you would you end up giving up a parking space if you shortened it up and would people walk across? You know, would you actually you know uh, have a crosswalk painted on there and then right into a through a parking space or how would you access the building? Well, and that's a very good point, Jim. If, if we came directly across uh, paralleling that, uh, that end uh, parking space and then uh, going straight across to where the front door is going to be, then yes, we would end up losing a parking space in front of the building. Otherwise, we would end up angling it to uh, essentially be able to hit the uh, edge of that wing, uh, which mm -hmm. is a bit of a, of a unique angle across the parking lot, but it's easy enough to be able to stripe. So we can certainly do it that way. You have plenty of parking. Yeah, it just takes out one of the parking spaces immediately in front of the building, which is the vast majority of places where people are going to look first. We can play with that. We can shorten that up. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of that. I just, I mean, this is an opportunity to try and at least comply with the spirit of the town center standards, you know, where the the design contributes to a village feel. And 
you know, I, I think that if you lose one parking space in front of the building to do that, so be it. I mean, you have way more parking than you need. The town center standards don't allow parking in front of the building. So, I mean, if you just lose one to create a little more pedestrian friendly path from the Ocean House Road sidewalk into the building, I don't see that as a great loss. That's how I would see it. So um, let's move on from that, unless anybody else wants to comment on it. Yeah, just Joe, just on the yeah you know, on the surfacing of the path. I'm not sure why stone dust versus pavers is a level of detail that we feel we ought to get into. Um, if the design people or the applicant feel that it's more in keeping with the landscaping, I'm I'm not sure why we should insist they switch to pavers. I I I'm I'm not in favor of requiring that, but others may be. I don't know. Joe? Yes, Maureen. I mean, for what it's worth, Peter, both the town engineer and the public works director just jumped all over me on the stone dust. Talking know, about just, how well, it's just a, a big weed patch and why would anyone want to do it? So I'm passing on their concerns. I, no, I, I, I noticed that. I just, you know, I, I'm not sure I agree. But anyway, whatever. Again, that's just a personal preference. There's not much difference as far as cost is concerned. It just seems to be in greater keeping with the character of the area. Um, and th this is nothing to do with the, uh, um, the public right of way. This is all on a private area. It'd be the same width, be the same depth. Um, I just don't, I think it would be kind of rather nice, a little toned it down a little bit than just having a uh, an asphalt sidewalk cutting straight through the middle of well, the yard. Well, we're not talking about asphalt. We're talking about pavers. I agree. I, I wouldn't ask you to do bituminous instead of stone dust. But we're definitely talking about pavers here. I mean, they have them at the police station, the, the new uh, Village Green. They've used some nice pavers. Um, they did a nice concrete walk. Well, it, it, that's in front of the uh, sea salt. Um, in my personal opinion, that our goal is to create a village feel and to conform with the rest of the town. And aesthetically, uh, I do feel like I have pretty good taste. And I feel like the stone dust is very minimal and it works sort of with the property. And uh, aesthetically, I, I prefer it personally, the stone dust. Um, that, that's my personal preference. And I do feel that it does meet the design requirements of the path leading to the store. I'll just chime in on my opinion on the path. I like the shortened up idea and as far as the material, I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other. Yeah, I'm all for it being shortened up as well. I, I do think the simpler would be better and more green space. Okay, so I'm hearing that people are generally okay with the stone dust. Is that a fair assessment? Joe, this is Dan. Uh, I like centering the um, pathway uh, for your recommendations, and I think pavers are the best or better way to go. Thanks. And there's centering. Uh, oh, Jim, go ahead. Yeah, Jim, I, I, I agree with, was it Dan that just said that? Yeah, I like the shorter one. I'm not a fan of stone dust. I'm with Jim and Dan on that. I, I like the shorter version. I think it makes more sense to do a crosswalk where uh, it was mentioned taking out a parking spot um, and yeah I prefer the pavers especially with the village green going in I mean, if you want that continuity within the town center I think that little pathway with grass surrounding it is going to match up very nice with the village green 
Um, but each property is sort of distinct and individual, and I understand the, the goal for conformity, but, um, but conformity doesn't mean that every aspect of the project needs to be the same. And, and I do think that the stone dust path does meet the appearance that, that, that I do think works with the property. Um, Carol Ann? Oh. I know you said how you weighed in, but can you just remind me? Uh, the shorter path, and I, I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other as far as material. Um, I think I think over time you'll find stone dust is a pain in the butt, but okay. uh, that's just that's fine if that's the route he wants to go. That's so okay. who am I missing, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, certainly shortening it up. I mean, if you've ever seen like a college campus where they have paths like that, pretty much nobody uses them and there's, you know, worn down dirt, the shortest route. So that just makes sense. Um, I mean, stone dust looks good on trails and whatnot. Um, I'm not sure necessarily, I, I don't exactly understand what you mean by keeping with the character of the site. I mean, I guess if it's going through like a woodland landscape or something, if there is meant to be a lot of landscaping around it, I think that makes more sense. Otherwise, I think the the pavers, just from a, you know, entry perspective from the street makes more sense, but. All right, so I, I think it's it sounds like most of the members of the board are in favor of requiring pavers there. Um, so let's move on. Um, all right, that's all I have, Maureen. Uh, do you want to um, say anything about the uh, uh, sound? Well, uh, you've seen a lot of things in the last uh, couple of days, and uh, I think that 400 square feet of space in that building, um, it's very, very important to make it clear what the board is approving. Um, I spoke with the sound engineer. He was very helpful. Uh, he, he said that if the dust collection system was not vented to the exterior, it would not be a significant increase in decibels. So if you're only using one piece of equipment at a time and the dust collection system, the, the applicant has submitted a noise study that looks like it'll be under the 65 decibels. Uh, the concern starts to come in when you look at what that 400 square feet is actually gonna be used for. And you know the, the applicant has submitted um, a life safety plan to, uh, that he's revising to the code officer that has rated that space as factory one as a workshop. Uh, so if it's going to be a workshop, then the expectation is there's going to be a lot more use of tools, maybe multiple tools at the same time, maybe multiple people at the same time. It's gonna be rented out as workshop space. Um, then I think you need to start being concerned about what you've got for noise. If the board is very, very clear, um, limiting what that space can be used for, then you're, you're probably okay with the noise. So the applicant has uh, represented that the workshop is only to be used for the do-it-yourself classes in the future and to cut lumber for um, customers who come to the store. Uh, it seems like we could have them put a note on the drawings that the shop would not be a workshop for uh, any other purpose, uh, nor could it be rented out for use by um, others. I mean, I, I think we need to make a very clear note on the drawing that that's what we're approving. That's fine. Can we, can we simply just put the two tool limit? I think, I think if we just limit the amount of tools that could be used at a time, I, I think that might be a better, um, 
I, I don't know what I'm trying to prevent. I, I just worry about putting too many limitations upon the use of a space. Um, if someone wants to come in and make a table, if I have a friend who says, I want to make a table, can I use the, the space? Just one person in there. Uh, I don't want to say no. Um, I, I'm not saying I would do that. I have no plans of doing that. I just don't want to limit myself at this point from allowing just sensible things to happen in a, in a pretty nice space. But doesn't it then become something else if you're letting someone other than a store employee uh, cut lumber for a customer? Uh, I'm just thinking for future use. So at some point I will come back and request for classes. Well, um, so maybe Michael, at, I mean, maybe at that need, point I request that. You need to define that. the use. Yeah. All right, I just get worried about putting too many limitations on the space, but I could come back at a later date uh, when I have other ideas I'd like to propose. Correct, you yeah. can, but that's not what we're talking about tonight is what you might come back with in the future. But we're talking that's fine. about I understand. what you want to do now. That's fine. Yeah, Joe, to me, this is, we're really talking about an ancillary use and it's ancillary at the moment to the lumber store itself, which I take it to be cutting pieces of wood for the people who have purchased there. The, the next level was the do-it-yourself classes, and that's yet to be approved because Michael hasn't shown up with his plan. The third level, which I, which, well, I would be concerned about, is where this became a production facility to support Michael's other businesses of building things, which I understand he does. So right. It's, it's not intended to meet that third level of use. Exactly. Under any circumstances. I agree. Exactly. But so, Peter, does that mean that you would support having these restrictions uh, put out on the note and on the plans so the applicant knows what he can and cannot do in that space? Uh, well, yeah, at the moment, uh, if we approve something now, it's simply uh, cutting of wood products that are being purchased at the Lumbery retail outlet. If he comes back in with the do-it-yourself classes and instructions and so forth, that will require, you know, an amendment to the, to the site plan, which uh, I think the applicant is fine with. I'm fine with that. But, but, but the, John, what, the point I'm making is that we do not envision this thing ever becoming a manufacturing facility to support Michael's construction business. Understood. Thank you. Joe? Yes. Morning. I, I, and I, I guess this is the concern. I, I showed this to the code officer and was asking him, you know, how he would process this. And, and I just want to make sure everyone is seeing, maybe I'm wrong, but when I go to Home Depot or Lowe's and I get a cut, it's a saw sitting on the side of an aisle. And the applicant is proposing to build a whole room with walls, uh, maybe with a door, maybe not with a door. It seems like a pretty significant investment for a casual cut for someone who's buying lumber. Well, it's for especially, future use. It's, it's especially when you're submitting life safety plans that are rating this as a factory use. And your own website says that you're trying to move your Willard Square business into this building when, um, you know, to be honest, I asked you that question at the February planning board meeting and you said, no, you're not doing that. So there's some concern that the building isn't really matching what the story is for what the uses are proposed. Well, well then I'll clarify the story. The, the 400 square foot space for the tools was initially proposed for the classes. So I'd like it to be there for when I do come back for my amendment to the site plan to allow for classes. So I'd like to build that in now for planning for the future. And in terms of Willard Square Home Repair, I'm gonna have an office with a desk and a computer there. But um, even at my old space, we weren't even inside the building. And I will not store anything inside the building for Willard Square Home Repair. They were all, all the materials, all the tools will be in trucks. And, uh, and for the industrial usage, uh, Ben told me that if I'm cutting anything, 
regardless that I do need to put down industrial use as one of the uses. So um, he said, if there's any saws involved, I need to list industrial as one of the uses. So one thing, F1 is an IBC uh, classification. And I think the town's classification of a wood shop would be different, right? It would be something like uh, cottage manufacturing or that's a question for you, Maureen. I think I think it would, but again, even the cottage industry, cottage industry manufacturing was not supposed to be uh, a heavy duty industrial use. It was supposed to be someone who had at least 25% of the space actively engaged in retail sales and you know doing stuff in the back that was also um, constructing things. And to again. You know there are there are indications on the applicant's website that he's going to be building things, and this is a very nice room for an occasional cut for uh, a customer. Yeah, as I stated, it's a very nice room for future classes to teach uh, people in the community. So can I ask a question? Yes, please. So this is probably a Maureen. Um, what does factory one allow, like up to? And um, are we just sort yeah, of in a, I, sorry, I go ahead. The fact, I mean, all those classifications are um, something the code officer is using as part of the building permit. And typically I don't get involved and the planning board doesn't get involved in those. Um, alarm bells kind of went off because they seem to be very different from what was being proposed to the planning board. I mean, there's plans that label that room a workshop. And I don't believe that's what the planning board was told. So is this sort of a partial collision between planning board sort of uh, work and um, the code enforcement work and, and the language between the two being not quite harmonized? No, I wouldn't say this is a collision at all. I would just say that, um, you know, sometimes what the planning board is told, the, the test of whether how accurate that is, is when the building permit comes in. So it seems logical then just to, to have, you know, in our approval that what is allowed in what is allowed, period, right? I think. It, it, again, you know, I, I've, I've asked, I asked the applicant, I think in the April memo I sent to the board to provide a clear statement of what was proposed. And I, I still don't think that we have a statement in, and if there is going to be another submission by the applicant, I think it must include a clear statement of what is proposed for the uses that the board is being asked to approve now. Um, because I, I'm, my concern is that um, the board votes to approve this project, the business gets up and running, I start getting calls from the planning board saying, well, why is he doing this? Why is he doing that? I wanna make sure that what you, what you think you're approving is what's on the plan because the code officer was not gonna have a lot of flexibility. Um, only what is on the plan is what he's gonna be able to enforce. And frankly, the plans have been a bit of a moving target. Joe, can I say something on that? Yes, please. I, I think moving target is a nice way to describe this because quite frankly, I'm sitting here now with even more questions than I had when this meeting started on what's being offered, what's being sold, what the use is for. And quite frankly, uh, with all due respect to the applicant, credibility goes a long way with me. And when this was presented to us that the Scott Dyer side was a brick side, that there's no way that you can put in anything, it's gonna to be too much of a cost. And I know we've already talked about this, I'm not trying to get into a door, but then all of a sudden a window pops up and we start getting pictures of two openings, which really look like probably in the old gas station, they were a men's room and a ladies room entrance. And that could have been part of, but it was presented to us on numerous occasions that nope, I can't put anything on there because it was all 
it was all brick it, we couldn't it was all blocking we couldn't do it it's too cost prohibitive and then on the last submission there it is a window which means that there could have been an entrance on that side as well but it wasn't presented that way and to not have a clear distinct use of this to say well i'm going to use it for the future i'm going to use it now that goes against everything that this board is what we are tasked with doing which is coming up with a plan knowing what we're getting and going forward with the future because that's what we are asked to do by the town of cape elizabeth and we are asked to go with the guidance of what the town council has deemed essential for our ordinances so right now looking at this I have questions about that OPEC window. I have questions about the why now on the side by Scott Dyer, um, the selling of wood products, what's being cut. Now we're being told that you're gonna have seasonal items like snow shovels and rock salt that really have nothing to do with lumber and cutting of wood. But those might be something that's gonna be, well, what happens in the summer? Is the surfboard thing gonna come out again? That was mentioned by a member of the public a couple months ago uh, that you had mentioned on your Facebook page apparently. And then also looking at the memo that was prepared by uh, Maureen, when we have a motion for an approval that has at my count, 13 conditions of approval that go along with it. I can't remember the last time or if any times in the last five years that I've been on this board that we've had a motion to approval that has had 10 conditions, or excuse me, 13 conditions of approval that go along with it. Usually it's maybe three or four. The last time that I remember there was a concern over an applicant uh, who had numerous conditions of approval, it got tabled by this board because the board felt that it was too many. And that was the uh, 19 Wells Road project by Crown Castle for a cell phone tower, which there were 10 conditions of approval. And this board just said that, nope, that's too much. And we tabled it. So if this is gonna go to a vote tonight, I can just tell you I'm in a firm no on, a, on approval for this project right now. I like the fact that you that the architect and what she did uh, with making a front door that is fair to say a much greater improvement than what we've been having on the Ocean House Road. But right now, it's just there's too many questions. And to me, we wouldn't be doing our due diligence. We wouldn't be doing our job if we said yes to an application that has 13 conditions of approval and we're discussing what's gonna be on the note. I've said this numerous times, and this is I think the fourth meeting that we've been talking about this. These projects come to us, they are a package with a bow on top. I feel like we are basically putting this into the package and being asked to wrap it. And I'm just, I'm at a loss. And so where I stand, and I don't even know if we're discussing this right now, but there are just way too many questions for me to get on board with this at this time. Joe, Joe, Joe this is Dan really quickly. I, want, I just want to follow up with Jonathan's um, discussion about the use of the project. At the beginning, this applicant started out with, it's going to be a lumbery, a retail store. Um, we're going to have classes. We're going to have food trucks, um, music, now it's you know now it's been narrowed to a to a retail type establishment, but I agree with Jonathan. I'm not clearing what's going to happen in this place, and I'm not on board with it. And we're not even talking about the exterior about the lighting along 77 yet. So that's my comment. Well, if if you give me a moment, I could be hold on, Michael. Clear. Hold on, Michael. Let me just. I'd like all the. Uh, I would like all the members of the board to respond to uh, Jonathan. Peter? Yeah. Go um, ahead. I mean, I, I share Jonathan's view of the moving target, but it seems to me that it's within our power and really our responsibility to say if we, you know, to reduce it to simplicity and start and forget about all these little collateral things that have been floating around that we swatting at them like flies. Um, right now, if the applicant wants to have this rectangular building approved to sell lumber and associated carpentry equipment, uh, full stop, that's fine. If, in, the, if in, the, in doing that, he wants to build kind of a snazzy elevated room, which he represents at some point will be available for classrooms, uh, that's fine too. 
And, but if, if we limit what we're approving and anything else that happens is simply not consistent with the approval, it seems to me what is bothering Jonathan, which I fully understand, goes away because he'll be approved for A, B, and C, period. If he wants to come back with D, E, and F, that's another day, another application, and we can think that one through at a later date. So I, I guess I don't get too concerned about things that might happen later that he might want to do. Uh, you know, we can face that in, uh, when the moment comes. But I'm not, uh, I'm not against getting the basic uh, use uh, that the site plan is supposedly addressing approved and get that site looking better and being productive and being a more, uh, you know, appropriate part of our village center. Um, any other board members? I'm leaning towards Peter's opinion. Um, and uh, just, I understand clarity of use would be a wonderful, wonderful thing. And uh, if it's up to us to create that clarity, then I guess we have to create that clarity. I'd so, be, uh, Jim? I guess if I had to, I would vote for a motion to table. If I was voting, if the motion was for approval, I would say no. Yeah. Not going into much of detail, but the same reasons that Jonathan said. I do. I just don't want to keep repeating the same thing. So, Andrew. Um, yeah, I, I think I. I feel like the moving target thing has bothered me a lot because it seems like every meeting there's been a change of use, and we've never seen it really formal formalized on paper, uh, and. I think generally, yes, we see these things and, and th maybe they're not exactly have a bow on top, but at least it's all in there in the, in the package. And I feel like it's just not, all, it's just not quite complete. Um, maybe the ideas are there, but I feel like if we waited another meeting, it'd probably change again. So um, it's hard for me to, to fully accept something when it doesn't seem like it ever stops morphing from the previous. Well, yeah, I mean, one thing, I'd be very concerned that the actual use of the site is something that has to be clarified in the conditions of approval. That, that seems to me to be kind of backwards and I, I would agree with Jonathan that I would prefer to table this till the next meeting and have them work out all these issues um, and that I would not be ready to vote for approval of it this evening. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants to go through the conditions of approval that are on this to give the applicant guidance. Don't all speak at once. <laughs> well, well, the whole motion needs to need some adjusting because of the no longer the DIY classes, uh, and uh, well, we haven't even can discussed I, the. Can I ask uh, for a clarification on something? Could, could I just ask for yes. a clarification? Um, so a use you'd be approving is retail. So I don't know what difference retail would make if Where I is... sell. Oh, can I speak? Yes. I, I just need one clarification regarding the retail usage. If I sell um, wood or if I sell a surfboard, if I sell rock salt, because if I, if you approve me for retail and I move out, someone else could move in and do retail and sell clothes. So the, the specific items that I'm selling, I'm not sure why people are getting caught up on whether it's rock salt, a surfboard, or a piece of wood. Because it'll be approved for industrial use, which is I could cut wood for customers. It'll be approved for retail, which is that I could sell items inside. And it'll be approved for office, which I could have an office inside. 
and um, and if you want to have limitations on what I could do in the workspace, I'm totally fine with that because my goal is simply to cut a piece of plywood or to cut a piece of two by four for a customer. So um, yeah, I did. I mean, I maybe people didn't know the whole story at first because. I am wood-based using wood from Maine, but I'm also using associated items. And I'm not sure why that threw people for a loop, because it is retail. Um, so I don't understand if it's classified retail, why people are getting hung up on whether there's rock salt or a rake. Um, my, my goal is to sell items that'll benefit the people of the town. So in the summertime, if, if I sell, I don't know, a little garden shovel, I, I think that's okay. Because it is retail. Um, I, I'm sorry if it has seemed confusing. I, I mean, it's gonna be a wood store with associated items for wood, and I will, I'll have an office, and I'll be cutting wood for customers. And, and things have changed based on situations. Uh, I didn't realize that I needed a handicap accessible lift to get to the workshop area. So I changed, that's called pivoting based upon situations and how much I could afford. So I, I think people see that as a detriment that I'm changing my plan, but I'm actually changing it based upon the recommendations of the board, basing upon how much money I have and basing upon time frame. And uh, I, I feel like I made a lot of changes to the property, to the site that conforms with what the board wants. And, and I feel like my mission at this point is pretty clear retail office and cut wood for customers. All right, uh, there is one item we haven't touched on yet, which is the lighting, the uh, street lights. Uh, Joe? Jim, yeah. Yes. Okay, so I talked to Bob Malley. Um, and I asked him uh, to be able to provide me some of the information based on the lights that are similar to the ones that are already there, and he did. Um, he did not know where to obtain them, and he did not know what the costs were. So we reached out to a local lighting company and uh, passed on the information that the, the town had given to us, that Bob had sent me. And they said, yep, we can come very, very close, uh, if not spot on, to these particular manufacturers. And there are a couple of different uh, um, styles in town. Uh, Essentially what, and this is Swaney Lighting, and essentially what they said was that uh, each fixture, each pole, and then each fixture that goes on the pole is gonna be approximately $1,500 each. So it's basically $3,000 just for the pole and the, the light. Then you've got obviously the base and the hardware and what have you that goes with that. Now I know that we're not being asked to hook this up. This is in the right of way. So it's not an electrical issue. Um, but we're essentially looking at uh, what was um, proposed to be three poles uh, along Ocean House Avenue or Ocean House Road in front of this area, um, each of which is going to run somewhere, by the time you're done with the bases and what have you, each of which is going to run somewhere between $3,500 and $4,000. In and of itself, that's not a huge consideration. Multiply that times three and you get basically $12,000 for a, an area that would probably be enhanced with this to be sure especially given that the other side is ostensibly on board to have a few lights. Uh, but as opposed to a multi-million dollar project going from excavation up to the peak of the roof, which is what the, the new area next to the town hall is, which is what sea salt was, the police station, et cetera. Uh, this is an existing site with an existing building on a shoestring budget, trying to make it work and still be as effective as possible with landscaping and aesthetics and what have you. So we want to contribute, but contributing for this type of site, $12,000 for those lights is a little pricey on top of everything else, particularly when this site gains absolutely nothing from that other than an aesthetic along the road. So we are happy to contribute, and I talked to Michael about this. What we'd like to do it would be to contribute essentially one of those lights or basically $3,500 to $4,000 to an escrow fund because we don't want the condition of approval being attached to um, uh, or in the conditions of approval or the certificate of occupancy being tied to those lights because we don't know when those lights are going to go in. I mean, it could be this year, it could be next year, it could be three years from now. Um, so toward that end, we'd just like to put out to the board that uh, 
one the, the cost of one light, we can certainly absorb that as an escrow and we'll, we can deal with the town as to how they would accept that. Uh, but the three lights that are proposed in the middle of that is just an exorbitant cost that has literally nothing to do with the actual site. End of story. Any questions about the lights? I just don't see how we can not put in the lights because it's in part of the town center plan. I understand the cost, but uh, the other sites in town have these lights. And um, as Maureen has said in other meetings, if we do not put them in, it is, uh, we're opening ourselves up to, uh, you know, you know, the next guy will, you know, he can say, well, we didn't make him put it in. Why do I have to put them in? So. Well, I don't, I don't think we're talking Jim, about actually putting them in. I know that may be a matter of semantics, but certainly contributing to them um, only because we don't know when the town's going to get around to actually put them in. But, um, but contributing to the escrow, that's, that's not an issue as far as one of the lights is concerned. Keeping in mind again, yes, we want to be able to adhere to the town regulations as absolutely closely as possible. But any given regulations for any given zone in any given town are generically written for every possible um, situation that we can think of in every possible parcel. And regulations don't work that way. There are certain parcels, this one case in point, that are unique enough that there's got to be a little bit of give and take back and forth. Now, we don't want to set a precedent by saying, no, we're just not going to do that. I mean, the board can make us do this anyway. But we, that's not the purpose. The purpose is to work with the town. But when we're looking at these other sites that the board continues to mention, these are sites that start, and we were directly involved in one of them. Um, these are sites that started from below grade with actually tearing buildings down, making uh, you know, foundations from the ground up. And these are multi-million dollar sites. This one isn't like that. This one is taking advantage of everything that's been there as much as possible. And the lighting is great as far as aesthetics are concerned, and we want to contribute. But that's a disproportionate contribution for this particular site relative to the other sites in town. So again, we want to contribute, but the $12,000, and that's just from one lighting company, for lights that don't do any, anything for whatsoever for this project is just a little steep. That's all it is. It's just a little steep for this particular project. And that's all we're asking is just a consideration, not for nothing, but for a reduction in what otherwise might go out there in terms of the number of lights. All right, Maureen, I got to ask you this. Um, because one thing I'm still not really clear on is how much, uh, how, how much leeway we have on this question of whether or not to require the lighting. Um, and I don't know if that's something we need to ask the town attorney. Um, but I, I think you can do, I, I think you can go either way. I mean, to be very fair, it, the, the ordinance says sidewalk, there is sidewalk there. I think you could make a, a judgment in either direction. I, I would like to say, though, that, um, you know, we talk about installing the lights. We're not talking about just popping them in the ground. You actually have to run the wiring and, and make them work. Wait a minute. The, the applicant the, does. The applicant has to do yeah. all the drilling, the installation, the wiring, yeah. hookups, and everything? Yes, that's what all the other applicants do. Okay, now you're talking about a, a significant extra cost. I mean, this... Economics isn't supposed to enter into decisions, but it does all the time. And now if you're talking about going beyond just the poles and the fixtures, now it jumps from 3,500 to 4,000 up to probably the better part of $5,000 a light. Now we're looking at $15,000, which for a lot of people in Cape doesn't mean anything, but for a lot of people it does. And to add an extra 15 grand for which we received no benefit, other than living in the town and seeing the aesthetic, We'd be happy to contribute a portion of that, a third of that, even the 5,000. I mean, I'll, I'll speak for Michael at the moment, uh, but he's on board and he can cut in. It's just, again, you know, well, this is a, a long facade for this particular site with a fairly expensive proposition that doesn't have anything to do with this site.
Can I just say one thing on the, I understand yes. costs can be very prohibitive and I understand that and I respect that. Uh, but to say that it has nothing to do with the site, we've spent a good amount of this conversation talking about the pathway that's going to go out to the sidewalk that's going to basically make an entrance way from the sidewalk to the building. And so to say it has nothing to do with the site, it's just, in, to me, not accurate about what this site entails which has always been town center. This has not been a change. It was town center when the property was purchased. It's been town center the entire time. This restriction or this, uh, you could call it a restriction, but it, this requirement has always been on the books. Other people have done it. And to just describe it as not contributing, not being part of this piece of property, I just think is inaccurate. And I, I can understand the prohibitive costs on it and, I feel for you on that, but at the same time, there's not, to me, it's sort of what Jim was talking about, and um, Jim Hubner, that it's, we set a precedent here, and if we are requiring it here, we're going to be requiring it in other places. I think the town, or I think the board is in one requirement with having an entrance way on these two pieces of both Ocean House Road and Scott Dyer. They're sort of looking past one of those because of the existing building. But if it's part of the ordinance, I think, in, in my opinion, our hands are tied on it being a requirement of the application. Can I speak for a second? Hold on. Any uh, planning board members want to weigh in on this? Yeah, uh, uh, Joe, this is Dan. I agree with Jonathan. I, I, I've got Google Maps up. I'm looking at, you know, an overview of this building. This is the entrance way to Cape. I mean, if we're going to be putting, if the town is going to be putting lights on the, on the east side of 77, we need lights on the other side um, to match. But, but we're setting precedent here. I agree. Another applicant could say, wait a second, you know, uh, Michael didn't get the lights. And that's number two. And then number three, it's in the ordinance. I think we need the lights. Thanks. So this is what I just want to be clear on. And I'm going to ask Maureen one more time. I mean, we feel it, it's, we say it's in the ordinance. What exactly does that mean? Okay. So I'm looking at the town center under the design standards. Um, it's under G, landscaping and site development. The first paragraph is front setback. And what page, Maureen? Page 99. Um, the land in the front yard setback is a transitional space between the public domain of the road right of way and the private structure, it is in a determining de factor in the character and ambiance of the town center. This area shall be designated in landscape to be pedestrian friendly in scale, access, lighting, and security. A sidewalk and other pedestrian pathways, such as to the building and two parking areas, shall be located between the road and the structure. The side of the structure facing the front yard setback shall be designed with a distinctive entrance for pedestrians. Multifamily dwellings shall be designated with main entrance facing the front yard. So that's what we're talking about. It's talking about a sidewalk and other pedestrian pathways shall be located between the road and the structure. And then we have I think that's our okay under D building and parking orientation first impression all the building is from the side which faces the street. The front facade of the structure shall face the street. The structure shall be des designed with a primary orientation to the street, although the primary entrance may be located on other than the front facade. The front facade shall include a distinct entrance. A sidewalk shall be constructed parallel to the front facade. So because there are existing sidewalks there, uh, but they don't meet the standard of what we've been requiring for sidewalk. I think the board could make a determination that the standard has been met because there is a sidewalk there, albeit not in very good shape, with no lighting, no street trees. Um, actually, there might be a few. And, or you could make the determination that this isn't meeting the standard and that you're, you're splitting 
um, the baby in the bathwater, where the, the sidewalk is there, you're gonna live with the sidewalk that's there, but you're asking the applicant to do his part and install some lighting. And what I did try to do in the sketch that was in my uh, memo was not to show lighting along the entire frontage of Ocean House Road, but to try to uh, corral the uh, requirement to try to match the effort that the, the applicant needs to make. And I did look at the design for the sidewalk with the street trees and the lighting that's going in um, next month. And those lights are about 65 feet apart. So that's where you got that sketch that I did where I came up with about three lights, um, about 65 feet apart. I was a little surprised that they actually worked out kind of nice matching up with the pathway that the applicant is already proposing. But it, it, it's a board decision. I hope that helps. I have a yes. question. I have a question, Joe. Yeah, Carol Ann. Um, so I know the town's doing the east side of 77. Do they have in their plans to replace that sidewalk on the west side of 77? No, no, it's, it's um, what we've been doing is we have a town center plan. Uh, the first version of that was 1993. The second version um, was 2014. And um, we took the town center and identified places where there were no sidewalks where we wanted them and created a basically an infrastructure plan. There are eight segments of places where we have no sidewalk and we want them. So because the sidewalk is here, it's really not part of our town center improvement plan. We're, we're focusing on the places that there are no sidewalk. Okay. I was kind of hopeful that we could maybe come up with a collaboration thing if that was in the future. <laughs> well, and, and I was hoping the same thing, especially since the work is going in across the street in a month. And that's why I've been trying to say, let's hurry up and do this because uh, the town has uh, a really great electrical engineer who's been figuring out how to bring power. My hope is what we might be able to do some of that work on this project, but that collaboration window is very quickly closing. Maureen, do you remember why we did not require uh, Zev's project to have street lighting on the street on uh, 77? Yeah, because he didn't do any sidewalk on Route 77. There was sidewalk on his on that frontage, but he did build an extensive amount of sidewalk on Hillway. Um, so he built sidewalk almost the entire length of Hillway. And we had never identified Hillway as a location where we would put in pedestrian lighting. So he did sidewalk and street trees on Hillway. Okay. But I, I appreciate the fact that they, the cost is, is so high and there is a willingness to make a contribution. And I think it's too bad that, that the timing wasn't better to have that contribution and the town collaboration uh, kind of work together. Hmm. Well, Joe, can I mention one thing? Joe? Yeah. Um, Maureen, when you, uh, when you were reading the regulations earlier, when you started, um, I think you said it was page 96 or 99 or something to that effect. Um, could you take a look at, I don't have the regulation here at home. Could you take a look at that again? Because I think I heard you say that the, as far as the ordinance is concerned, the improvements are required in the front setback of a given property. It's the front, it's in the front facade area. So okay. it doesn't, I mean, we rarely, actually it's not rarely, but typically this improvement requires people to build sidewalks in the right of way. And it's only where uh, we run a little short of right of way where sometimes a sidewalk will peek into the property and then we get an easement. So for example, in front of Sea Salt Market, almost all of that sidewalk was put in the right of way of Route 77. It was paid for by the applicant the portion of the sidewalk that 
kind of bends towards the front door ended up in the on the private property and for that we got a private access easement but these standards have always required sidewalks to be in the right of way okay i'm uh, just curious matter of semantics again talking about uh you know the ability of the town to be able to require certain things off-site disproportionate to the size of the property but if that's what the board feels so be it there, there the standard doesn't talk about the size of the property or the value of the improvements the trigger has always been site plan review and you know there have been property owners in the past that are doing redevelopment of their property small additions who have uh, complained bitterly about this standard it went before the town council and the council decided that um, the incremental addition of sidewalks in the town center to supplement the infrastructure investment the town was already making was appropriate. As a supplement, not necessarily as a replacement. So if we, if we contribute, yeah, if Michael- what I, what I mean is there, you know, for example, 1226 Shore Road, uh, Dr. Johnson did not want to put that sidewalk in. He was required to put it in. He bitterly complained. The entire proposal was reviewed by the council and the council decided that requiring people to put in sidewalk along their own frontage was not unreasonable. Uh, the uh, LP Murray bit property on Shore Road subsequently put in their own sidewalk just to be good citizens. Just looking to whether or not it's absolutely required or as you mentioned earlier, whether it was up to the pension of the board. All right, well, it's time for the board to do its job here. Um, does anybody want to make a motion? I will. This is Jim. Um, I know. Jim, I, I should okay. point out to you, Jim, if you're going to make a motion that the next meeting of the planning board is July 21st. Yes, I know that I, I saw that. Thank you. Um, a motion for the board to consider a motion to table. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Michael Friedland, uh, DBA Yam Yams LLC for the site plan review to operate a 1,324 square foot village retail lumber store, 400 square feet institutional use for do-it-yourself classes and 256 feet of office in the existing 1,980 square foot building located at 287 Ocean House Road be tabled to the regular July 21st, 2020 meeting of the Planning Board. Do we have a second? Second. All right, does anybody wanna discuss this any further? I just want to say one thing on this. I really hope that if this does get tabled, that we have some more concrete information next meeting, um, because I don't want to be going into a fifth meeting with so many questions um, from uh, about this application. Okay, anybody else? Okay, Maureen, please call a roll call vote. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Mrs. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. It's a yes, Maureen, but point of procedures. Uh, 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 someone just put something in the chat, which raises a question about public comment. The board has already held a public hearing. Um, that's a good question. Typically, you allow public comment at the beginning, at the end of a meeting. Okay. Um, well, then I'm, we will. I'm sorry to interrupt that vote, but. That's okay. That's all right. So we will now open the meeting to public comment. Um, Maureen, you have a list of people with hands raised. Let me find that. Anybody. Okay. So now, 
I, I just want to make clear to whoever's going to speak that we do limit uh, comments to three minutes. Um, so with that in mind, uh, Maureen, you can go ahead and bring up the first person. Oh, yes. Please state your name and your address in Cape Elizabeth, or I guess it doesn't have to be Cape Elizabeth. Okay. Yeah, I'm um, okay. Um, hmm. Hang on just a second here. Okay, um, just give me a moment. I am, for some reason, this is not letting me allow this person to speak, but I'm just gonna keep playing with it until it does. Okay. Are you still hosting the meeting or is somebody else in charge and that's why? I uh, No, I'm the host, I believe. It's a good question. No, Alyssa. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> You're still hosting. You didn't even know it, did you? You were doing a great job. <laughs> I think Alyssa, you're muted. So yeah, Alyssa, I'm still seeing you as host. I think if you click next or put under participants and you bring up the list and you click next to your name, there should be an option to do other things. Okay, um, or you I could can... rec you got it? No. Right. Do you want to just go to the attendees and recognize the person who raised their hand? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, make, allow them to speak. Got it. Okay, um, I am the person. My name is Victoria Valent. I live at 58 Cottage Farms Road. Um, can people hear me all right? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciated um, your, um, your discussion in regards to use. I've been following this since February, and um, I am also a little confused on what the use will be. And so I did appreciate the conversation. I think what's confusing me the most is when I listen in on the meetings, I hear one thing, and then when I go up to uh, the heavily publicized Lumbery website, I see something totally different. And I find that very confusing. Um, so I won't get into the website um, so much. I, I, you read my letter. I hope everyone has taken a look at the website. And um, with all the changes that have been discussed, I do hope the applicant goes up and changes the website to match what is going on. I think that would help with some of the confusion. What would also help with some of the confusion is that in the site plan, there is a, a picture that depicts a, um, a wood shop. Um, is this is not going to be a classroom and, and, and it's going to actually be a cutting room, I understand. That was the term used by the applicant. It'll be a cutting room um, in which they'll make cuts uh, um, for people. I was wondering if they could amend the site plan to change the word wood shop to cutting room and also some type of narrative. I don't know if it needs to be in a site plan, but some type of narrative that just outlines everything that we've heard tonight, that this is going to be a lumber yard office and retail, and maybe get an explanation of exactly what the retail is, because now I'm hearing garden shop, but shovels, not quite gardens. I, I, it seems to be all over the place. So I'd appreciate maybe a note, something that says that the cutting room is for employees only, power tools will be used by employees only, things like that that would just clarify exactly what's going on. In regards to the traffic study, I don't have everything in front of me. I think the traffic study was done for a lumber yard and classroom. And if this is going to be retail, if there's going to be, um, 
more than just a lumber yard, I would like to think the traffic study, because it is a high crash area, should include retail. I think I just heard the applicant say tonight he will be selling those surfboards on site. Um, it would be, once again, it would be nice. What are you selling on site? I've heard shovels, rakes, rock salt. Will it be more? Um, in your website, you do mention about um, the workshop will be used to create in-house creations for sale. It, once again, website, what I'm hearing, they don't match up, but I would like to know, you know, in your narrative, will you be creating in-house creations? Um, some of this goes back to parking. If this is going to be not a lumber yard, but a retail, things like that, office, making sure we do have enough parking. It sounds like we do. Also for um, any uh, traffic studies. And also, once again, noise. This really is an issue, too, when we come to what is the use and noise. And if it's really going to be just a cutting room, then I wouldn't I ask that also there should be um, some soundproofing possibly uh, because I noticed for the traffic study, uh, the classroom allows five people and one instructor. And it goes back to the conversation you folks had earlier when you were talking about how many power tools will be going on at once. And, and so there's a, a lot here as you acknowledged earlier in your conversation. And I would just appreciate now that we are moving away from food trucks and it, which is still on your website and, and we're going into selling surfboard. I mean, what is this site going to be used for? And in your next submission, it'd be great to have some type of a narrative that says, this is what we're doing because you say you're here to serve the community and I'm a member of the community. I'd love to know what's going to be going on on that site. And I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victoria. Is there anyone else? Uh, I don't see any other raised hands there. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing, uh, public comment period, and we can resume our vote. Maureen? There were six votes in favor, and the only vote, I, I believe, yes, Mr. Sarbeck said his vote was yes, and the only vote we had left was you, Mr. Shillock. Yes. That's seven to zero. Okay, the motion passes. All right. Thank you, gentlemen and gentlewomen. All right, thank you all. So on to the next item. So Alyssa, until you can figure out how to make me the host, you got to hang in there for a few more minutes. I was going to ask, if I leave, does this end everything? Um, it, I, it might. I yeah. will. I think if you right click on your name so you or on <laughs> Maureen's name, you should be, if you pick, if you look, see where it says participants at the bottom of the screen? Yes. Click on that and that should open up the list of participants. And then I will make Marine host. Oh, thank Good you. Good night. <laughs> yes, Maureen is now the host. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, I was going to make one request. Just if we can just get a list to kind of streamline how, what we need to clarify so that it makes it easier for next time. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but... I'm, I'm very happy to meet was, with you, to Zoom meet with you. Yeah, I, mean, I just heard a lot of things, recite stuff. I know the architecture feels a little bit more cohesive, and I just wanted to say that when I joined, I didn't know all of the existing conditions. I was working from photos, so I apologize, Jonathan, that I went back and forth. But that's what Alyssa, happened. you're doing a great job, and I know you're new on this, so thank you for all your work on this. But yeah. But definitely recommend talking to Maureen. Typically, applicants will put it together a draft application and they'll have me look at it and provide comments. And mm -hmm. it's an opportunity to clean everything up before it gets submitted to the planning board. I am still available to do that. Yeah, I think that would just help streamline and tell a very straightforward narrative and it'll match everything so that there's a lack of this target. Because I, I feel, you know, joining the project late in the game, a little similar. So 
we'll get it next time. Thank you, everyone. And if I leave, I hope you guys are still on. No, you're fine. <laughs> Bye. Bye, thank you. Okay. The planning board will review meeting logistics. Does anybody want to review meeting logistics? Maureen. I just wanted to um, raise that as traditionally the board does not, not hold a workshop in July because it's on um, the July 4th week. And you've also given applicants an opportunity to have a special workshop so that they don't get behind a month. So I have at least one applicant who has asked for a special workshop at the end of the regular meeting on July 21st. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah, we'll see you guys for a whole month. Hello. You can always meet in the parking lot again. Yeah. <laughs> Any sense of when we're going to be able to go back to meeting in the room? I have a bad, I, 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 as some of you have noted, I now have my own Zoom account and I got the one year subscription. Oh. <laughs> um, you bad. don't, you don't want to be coming into this building right now. Yeah. Okay. All right, and finally, oh, the last item is public comment. So we'll open the meeting to public comment. Does I have no have public comment, but I'll, you do need to know how to use your Zoom to make sure you truly do mute the public so they can't do what I'm oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I can you, show Mark. you how to do that hey. because- oh, I can <laughs> We're done. <laughs> oh, there's these rogue, rogue attendees. I wanted, no, I wanted no, to. No, I'm not done. You didn't unmute me. I'll have to show you how to do. You're muted I've been, now. Wanting, I've been wanting to mute Victoria for years. Can I just put that on the record? No, I, I have to say it was nice to hear Victoria again. Well, thank you, because you did not unmute me. I will show you how to do that tomorrow. Gonna, I'll call gonna, you up. I'm going to. Can you talk now? Back in your controls. I think I finally got it. I think she can technically make a public comment since we're still in that period. <laughs> Not now. Um, all right, so uh, I guess I need a motion to adjourn. Motion we adjourn. Wait, can I just say one thing? Oh, I, no. I do apologize for being late. I was using the old, um, uh, Matt, I think, had sent out a link. Yeah, there were two. I'm not waiting for it to begin. So I sent an email at about 7.05. Please disregard it if it's in your inbox. Um, but I do apologize for missing that minute's vote and getting on late. And then I got on the public one so I could see everybody and listen, but not participate. So I, I was in the same boat, Jonathan. I tried to use I used Matt's thing. It didn't work. And I was kind of floating around in <laughs> outer space here. I, I'm surprised we didn't run into each other, Peter. Over. It didn't feel any better. At the beginning of the last meeting, I was so busy trying to get people on board that I forgot to hit the record button. So I did do that this time. <laughs> so we All have right. a motion to adjourn, but no second. Yep. Second. Oh, wait, who made the motion? I did. Oh, okay. I'm seconding. Roll call. Mr. Podensky. Yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hubner? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Sarbeck? Yes. And Mr. Shalott? Yes. All right. See so you guys. Oh, are... meeting is adjourned. Okay. Thank you, July. Thank you, July. July. See you later. Bye bye. Bye. I feel like the Brady Bunch. Bye.